Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Hang Out with CERN. I'm Steve Goldfarb, and we are hanging out with penguins at CERN. Penguins, you ask. Freya Blechman, who's joining us all the way from across the pond in America over by Fermilab, is going to be giving us our social media questions and already has one which I'll ask right away, which is, which is it sounds great to be smashing penguins at CERN. So we're going to address that immediately. But first, <laughs> but first, let me introduce our guests. So from the LHCB experiment, I have with me uh, Tom Blake here. And uh, across across the road, over there at the CERN outreach area, I have um, I have Nico Serra, and he's joined by a theorist, Gilad Perez. Hello, guys. How is it over there? Good. You can see Nico's out in the universe, and Gilad is in the middle of the LHC. You guys, <laughs> look behind you. It must be cold uh, out there. Uh, you're going to answer our questions. We have questions about you know what are penguins. And mainly, how do you measure penguins with the LHC, and what does that do for us? Uh, before we get to the penguins, uh, let me just mention, last week we uh, talked to the alchemists from ISO. We learned a lot of things. For me, as an LHC experimentalist, I did not know uh, that they were doing over there, and it was fascinating. We will get back to them another time. I had a little note on the social media afterwards saying, we want more alchemy. alchemy. Uh, so we will get back to them. It's fascinating what they're doing. It's doing a lot of work towards medical research, making isotopes. Um, since last week, we also had three different news flashes, and I ask you to please take a look at the CERN website. I'll give you just the brief headlines. The 28th of May, the European Commission and CERN agreed today to support the construction of Sesame. That's what came out on May 28th. Sesame, a very interesting accelerator out in the Middle East. A lot of interesting bedfellows have gotten together to work on that, and uh, that's it's quite a unique collaboration. It's going, uh, it's going to go forward. Uh, we also heard a couple days later that the CERN Council formally adopted an update to the European strategy for particle physics. That's the strategy that we follow to try to make sure we're coordinated uh, and hit all of the fascinating world of particle physics. There's a lot of different areas, not just the LHC, not just ISO. But there's a lot of areas in research, and so we coordinate. We make a strategy, a several-year plan that was adopted. Uh, and, and if you want to read more about it, please go to CERN.ch. And finally, uh, it was just announced on the 3rd of June that CERN and Ars Electronica uh, launch an open call for artists working in the digital domain to apply for the third pre Ars Electronica Collide of CERN. So there's an artist residency. Bill Fontana, a brilliant uh, sound artist, has been our latest, uh, our latest artist in residence here at CERN. And so we're looking for someone who's excellent in the digital domain of art. All of these are on CERN.ch. Today, though, we're going to cover penguins. And Freya gave me our first question, which had to do with, with you know, what are we doing smashing penguins? In fact, you might be surprised by this, but we don't really smash them together, do we? are smashing penguins. There's no smashing. But we use penguins to try to figure out some new physics. So let me just start out with our trivia question, and then we're going to start asking these guys more of the details. So the idea, here's the question, the idea of a penguin diagram. Okay, so at least I should mention that a penguin is actually a Feynman diagram, and I'm going to give you a quick lesson on what that is. But the idea for this came from physicist John Ellis after he lost a bet to a fellow physicist. The question, the trivia question this week is what was the bet and what game were they playing? And I want to add to that who placed the bet with him and then who was the one who we actually lost to? So these are actually two different people. Uh, and uh, you can answer that once more by uh, tweeting using hashtag AskCERN or HangoutWithCERN or by putting it in the comments section on our, on our Google Plus and our, our YouTube site where you're watching this right now. Okay? There's the trivia question. Uh, now, let's get down. I'll give you a little bit of background because penguin diagrams can become complicated. Before we get to this guy here, okay, this is this is a penguin diagram. You got to start with something simple. So I have a 
black magic marker, certified prompt. And certified that is just simply a black magic marker. Yep, a black marker. A black marker, it works. And I have white sheets. I already started scribbling. I'll start from scratch. These are white sheets of paper, okay? And, and the theorist, Gilad, is actually on the other side of the road, okay? So I don't have any help. We're going to start up. Something simple that, that I remember learning is uh, from QED, quantum electrodynamics. Feynman diagrams, a brilliant guy, find, brilliant guys come up with simple solutions to complex problems. We have a lot of complicated mathematics. Science these days has complicated mathematics. You need mathematics to be able to express yourselves, to express your ideas, and, and, and to, yeah, and to go on to, to things. Oops, I just almost did that wrong. Okay, this is one of the first Feynman diagrams, and I'll even put in the particles, okay? And and the, the middle one can even change. So this is a Feynman diagram. This shows you a few possibilities. Okay, a Feynman diagram tells you that certain particles came in, something happened, and other particles came out over here. Am I doing that right? From here to there. That's kind of time goes in that direction. But Anything can happen. That's the brilliance behind it. So this this thing, if you turn it around, it looks the same, and the same. You can calculate it. You have the same probability. This tells you probabilities of things happening. What we measure, this is this is theory, okay. And for each of these little points here, this is called a vertex. This is called a propagator. That's called a vertex. Each one of these has a value to them, and you can put them into an equation and solve it, and you get a value, which is a probability of this happening. In this case, I had electrons, electron and, and a positron going in, making a photon, and electron and positron coming out. Or it could be seen as an electron, which emits a photon and comes over here, and that photon is, is absorbed by another electron, right? Elad will tell me when I'm wrong. So that's <laughs> but that's a basic idea. But in, in, in our world over here, it, when we measure stuff, at the LHC as an example, what we see is actually boom, boom, something like this. So we have a, a big question mark in the middle. We know what went in, we know we sent protons, in fact, actually there's even a question mark at the beginning because we know we hit protons, yep. but when protons there's quarks and there's gluons, so there's even question marks in here of what went in. Then we don't know. Mother Nature doesn't let us go in here, right? Am I right so far? Okay, do, yeah, okay. Do, do you still smiling? There's a half shake. <laughs> sort of a half shake. We don't really know. Mother Nature doesn't let us see what's inside here. And then we measure, though, the stuff that comes out. Now, the reality is that anything and everything happens in the middle there, right? Absolutely everything can happen in there, including much more complicated things than just a simple photon or a Z or something like that going through there. And what you have to do to make a calculation of a probability is calculate all of them, and that's your denominator, right? And then the process you want to look for is your numerator, is your single thing. Okay, I'm going to stop now before I get uh, beyond myself. That's a basic idea. So now you guys at LHCB, let's start with these guys. And before, so, so, so the Gilad can't yell at me yet. We'll start with the, with, with the experimentalists. You guys are looking at certain processes to get hints on what's going on on the inside. Maybe Tom, you can, yeah, you can tell us. The interesting part about these, these diagrams is that you are sensitive to everything happening. So in the standard model, we have a set of the particles. Mm -hmm. It's those particles which appear inside these diagrams. Uh -huh. If there are new particles out there to find, they also contribute. And uh -huh. you're, not, okay. you're not really limited by... Um, you can have anything. You really can have anything in there. So no matter what the energy, no matter what the mass of the particles, uh -huh. they, they can play a role. And this is one of the funny things about quantum mechanics is uh -huh. that you don't really have to conserve energy and momentum as long as you don't see it happening. So uh -huh. you don't ever see what happens inside these diagrams, and so you can introduce particles in there which are much, much heavier uh -huh. than you could produce in the, in the real world. Uh -huh. But you're still sensitive to them, and that's what we're trying to measure. We're trying to see if there's something going on in these, these, uh, these processes which doesn't match up with our understanding of the particles we have in the standard model. Okay. Is that right, Gilad? You can make something in there? You can make something in the middle there that's more massive than the energy that you've stuck into it? Is that true? 
Yeah, that's true, and this is all because of quantum mechanics. So this is uh, related, all related. One way to understand it is all related to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you produce it to short enough time, such that the energy that they produce, which violate the conservation of energy, is only produced to a very short time, uh -huh. then actually you're fine with it. And that's actually all about these uh, electroweak penguin diagrams. Uh -huh. Those diagram diagrams you actually produce two very heavy particles. In fact. Uh, this is dominated in the in the standard model of uh, of the forces and particles that we have. This is dominated by the most most heavy particles that we have uh, currently known to us. This is the the, the celebrated top quark. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you you see if you look at this uh, penguin, then you see in the middle you have uh, two two lines with arrows. This would be uh, this the production of uh, two top. Uh, Quarks, so actually more precisely one top and one anti-top. Each each of these top actually weight like a gold atom, so it's very very heavy. Mm -hmm. Even though you start with the B meson, so this is why the name of this experiment is LHCb. The B okay. is actually uh, the initial state, so this is a, a B meson, which is actually not very heavy a uh, particle. It's actually weight four times the mass of the proton. Uh -huh. But then, in its decay process, process, there is this magic, this uh, quantum mechanical magic, that for short times actually there are two particles produce this two top, which their mass is, is actually 50 times or, or 30 times heavier than the mass of the B meson. But this happens to a very short time, and then this disappears, and this is why it is so interesting because this is a very rare process where it allows us to look for things which are even heavier than these uh, top particles. Uh huh. So, 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 Nico, maybe, maybe you can fill us in a little bit more. How, how then, do you look for this uh, at LHCb? Yeah. Okay. So basically, as Gilap said. Okay. First of all, I want to say basically all day what we do is that Gilap, Gilad or the theories predict something, and we hope to measure something else. So what we do, as Gilap said, is. Uh, we cannot enter inside the loop. In, we cannot really loop the penguin in its space. We have access only at the particle that remains afterwards. So what we do in the end is to measure, try to measure very precisely the particle afterwards, get rid of all the things that in the smash of the two protons we, don't, uh, we are not interested in, and we try to reconstruct what happened in these very short times that we cannot measure directly, looking at the properties of the particle that are left. So this involves many times the construction on complicated quantities that we call observables. So for instance, making products of uh, uh, momentum, so for general public like velocity, or things like that, we can actually try to understand things that happen in these magic quantum worlds that we are not, uh, we don't have the direct access to. Nico, I actually have a question. Hi. Uh, that was uh, put on, you asked on YouTube by someone and then he deleted it. So even if people think they have stupid questions, sometimes don't. So the question was as follows. So what happens when your theory doesn't add up Does, or when you measure something else? Does that mean your theory is bogus? Uh, okay, actually, this is a very interesting question because uh, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, actually, this cross is, we, we, we cross finger. We are really uh, praying every day that what they predict is not what we measure, and uh, not because we hate the theorist. On the contrary, but because this would mean that there is something else beyond the standard model that needs to be discovered. So. Measuring this, if things do not match with the, the, what uh, Gilad and the other theories predict, we can understand that there is something, and we can even understand what is this something else that uh, doesn't belong to the standard model, but is new. And in jargon, we call it, in, in fact, new physics. Mm -hmm. so, so in, um, just to summarize, inside this penguin or inside anything, any, any side one of these diagrams, each one of these vertices, if I remember right, has a, has a value to it. But that value is, is something less than one, right? 
So, so the more you, you, you get of these, uh, the more vertices, when you multiply them together, the smaller a number it is. So the, the, the more rare the decay. Is that a good sort of yeah, summary? So, <laughs> so the, more, the more complicated the picture, uh -huh. the more, well, the less likely the process is to happen. Okay. So if you draw something very complicated, on average it happens less frequently than something that's much simpler. Okay. So your, your nice simple diagram earlier uh -huh. is quite common compared to this, this penguin. Because if I can draw that diagram, I mean, I could also draw uh, something more complicated. Let me try to do. I can I can put a loop in here, right? I can do something like like that. Exactly. So that this is I could draw if I from the other diagram I have, which was simple. I can also draw that, but that has more vertices in it. It has twice as many vertices, and therefore it has a much uh, lower value, less lower probability of being formed. So that's why, that's why you know, you get, to, you get the drawing penguins, you're getting to something pretty rare. But LHCB has something going for them, and you have a lot of data. You have an awful lot of, uh, of these B mesons produced. So this, actually, this, this picture you see at the moment where you see a, an anti-bottom quark and anti-strange quark, in reality, this is bound up due to QCD into a, into a, with, a, with another quark uh, to make a B meson. And we have huge numbers of these produced. So. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about rare decays, and sometimes we're talking about decays which happen once in maybe uh, every 10 to the 9 times a, a BDKs or 10 to 8 times a BDKs. This mm -hmm. is very, very rare processes. Okay. So to stand any hope of seeing them, you have to produce phenomenal numbers of these, these B uh, mesons, so mm -hmm. 10, 10 to the 12, so uh, uh, a million, million. Hey, you know, we're, we're used to that. I mean, I say, okay, I'm from Atlas. We, we can do the trillion thing. Not a problem. But you have to have a good detector, and you have to you have to be able to, to measure a lot of data and, and process it. Um, so so let me ask you this: I mean, why LHCb? Why do you guys focus on measuring B quarks as opposed to the other quarks? What's the advantage that you have there? Well, the, the B is the heaviest quark, which uh, which lives long enough to really measure and separate. So the mm -hmm. the top quark you heard about earlier, um, because it's so heavy, it decays almost instantly, uh -huh. and that is then it's more difficult to see in the sector than the B has a nice the B meson has a nice signature in it. It has a has some lifetime. It, it lives for some amount of time in the outer sector mm -hmm. before it decays. Uh -huh. And that means it flies some some small distance. Uh -huh. And you can actually see the you pick the B out by looking at the fact that it's flown a, a distance from where our, our collision happened. Okay. And this is quite a nice experimental signature. You can really clearly see that you have something that's it's got some lifetime, and that then is decayed. And that you so they're easy to label. To, to, to they're they're that, easy to label. That, that was a B. And then you, you look at it. Now, I heard some, some interesting jargon. Maybe I'll even let, let, him, let him say it. Flavor changing neutral currents. A new vocabulary to introduce out there. Do you want, there. You want me to address you that? Want to address that, or that or can I, you, I, I mean, the, maybe I, I go first and Gilad can correct me. Okay, okay. So um, the point of, of, of some of these, these these diagrams, including the one you're looking at, is um, you want to look for processes that are rare. Uh -huh. uh, and to do that, we have to look for processes which you can't draw a simple diagram for in the standard model. Uh -huh. um, and you have to look at properties of the standard model to do this. And one of the properties of the standard model is that you can't really couple quarks of, of different flavors. So mm -hmm. in this case, you have an anti-B and anti-S. Uh -huh. You can't couple them by anything other than the the, uh, the the weak interaction. Okay. So the photon okay. cannot couple. Uh, so the trangism cannot couple a, a B and a, a, an S quark, a producing a strange quark. You have to go to the, um, the weak interaction, and the weak interaction is charged. Uh -huh. and so if you look at a process which is from the outside neutral. Um, that involves some a change from a, a B to a, an S quark. You have to go to these these type of diagrams. So you have to go to something more complicated. You can't just draw a very simple picture of this. So I can't just take a B, a B, have it shoot off a photon, which then becomes an S and an S. Uh, well, this, this 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 turns okay. You, this you can do. Oh, I can do that. Oh, so well. you, it's, it's, <laughs> I just solved the problem. No problem. problem. <laughs> yeah. This is where it gets complicated. But um, for these, it turns out that. This, this type of diagram is what, what dominates. You, you can okay. draw simpler things, but they turn out to be rarer just because of the way the, the way you have to draw them. Okay. Sense. Okay. Maybe maybe it's, maybe if I I, I can uh, so this is related to the physics of flavor. So maybe I, I will say one or two words about the, the concept of flavor. Uh, sure. If it's okay. so so what what are flavors? This is this all belongs to what we call flavor physics. So what are flavors? 
So it turned out that the, the, the universe or our nature is made in a replica of, of same thing, actually three times. So uh, one, one could think, for example, about an electron. An electron is an object which uh, actually has electric charge uh, minus one. And we know and we understand it uh, very well. But actually, there's a, another particle, which is the sibling, the, the brother of the electron, which is called muon. And it has also the same electric charge, m minus one. So if you just think about how they respond to the uh, electromagnetic force, they are identical. There's no difference between the electron and muon. However, in reality, they are very different because the, the mass of the muon is actually 100 times the mass of the electron and, it, and actually decay very quickly after mm -hmm. a, a roughly 10 to the minus 6 of a second, 1 millionth of a second. Uh -huh. So uh, they are similar, but they are different in mass. And therefore, we call them two flavors. So the muon and the electron, they have the same electric charge, but they differ by, the, by their masses. Mm -hmm. So in, in this neutral current, if we just stick to electron and muon, it will be a process in which you start with a muon and end up with an electron, but not emitting any other uh, charged particle. So for example, this is one of the holy grail of other experiments, which are looking for a muon which emits an electron and a photon. Okay, so just uh, the photon is, doesn't carry any electric charge, so it's really what we call neutral current because we start with a charge minus one particle, which is the muon, the, the brother of the electron, and then we end up with an electron. The okay. same way this penguin, this electroweak penguin diagram mediate the process when you start with a B and end up with an S. This, the, the B and the S quarks are, are uh, actually, again, brothers in the same sense. They have the same charges, the same uh, electric charge, uh, and somehow these very rare processes uh, transform a B into an S. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, one should add, it's not only that the coupling are small, the coupling that involved in this process are small, it's also that if you uh, not consider quantum effect, this process will never happen. So you really have to uh, um, generate, induce this process with a loop where you induce these virtually heavy particles. That's what make it, uh, makes it so important and so unique. I like the other process that you shown in the diagram that you can actually have a, a three-level exchange of, uh, a, a, so a, I would say not quantum-level exchange of E plus E minus, emit a photon and go to E plus E minus. These processes that they are measured at LHCB would not occur if we didn't have this uh, qu miraculous quantum effect. That's what would make so, them... So, uh, so, so Gilad, Gilad, I have a question that's re related to this. Um, so so uh, somebody, uh, Lee Sachs actually, asks on YouTube, does that mean that uh, anything outside the standard called new, new physics, even if it's not proven, you can still see it? Even if it's not well, do you understand the question? I'm not sure I understand the question, <laughs> but certainly there could be many things that we didn't talk, think about that could exactly. happen in I nature. Think that's okay. what the question yeah, was. Yeah. We are infinitely stupid, okay? We are absolutely ignorant about what happened in nature in the microscopic uh, scale, very small scale. And the thing that would mo make us most happy is if we see some result which doesn't fit to our uh, rules of game. Okay, this is something which is different in, in science, in, in research, compared to other uh, branches of, of our life, that we are very happy to face paradox or, or things that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all, all we all we ask of, of you theorists is that you give us a, a a prediction, right? So if you come to us with a model which is new, which which has penguins in it, we're we're open to that. It has to be mathematically consistent with with and and it has to match the data that we already have and give us something to aim for, something to measure with our experiments, right? That's that's our only rules. And, and that's what, what's happening with LHCB. So you, you guys have some results uh, recently, which, it, which is measuring not necessarily this process, but another penguin. A, a, a similar process, actually. So if you look at this, this penguin, you have um, you had a, 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 what we call a gluon coupling the, the, the strange and anti-strange quark at the bottom of the diagram. Mm -hmm. And if you, go, if you go now back to the, uh, the other figure that flashed up very briefly, um, mm -hmm. so what we're looking at is rather than having a, a strange and anti-strange uh, quark being produced at the, at the edge, well, the output of the, the diagram, we have uh, something which is experimentally very clean for us to look for, which is a pair of these muons 
we okay. heard about earlier being produced. Uh -huh. So rather than having a, a strange and anti-strange, now we have a, something that goes yeah. from a, a beauty cork to a, well in this case an anti-beauty cork to an anti-strange I'll let you keep talking while I go plug in my okay, computer yep, for you guys. <laughs> we just had a message pop up here saying we're about to run out of battery. Um, but, so we have this, 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 this very similar transition. It actually looks very similar to the diagram we had before. If you rotate it by, uh, by uh, 180 degrees, but rather than having coupling through this, this gluon, which, is, um, which plays a role in, in QCD, and we have, a, we have either a photon or uh, this uh, neutral Z uh, particle. Um, and these processes are very clean experimentally. We have this, this nice pair of muons in the final state to help us go away and find them. Muons are quite a unique uh, particle to look for because they, they don't interact very readily in the experiment. They fly, they basically travel a long way through, and they can go all the way through the experiment before. Uh, yeah, for being stopped, and that gives us a very clean way to go and look for these uh, these decays. Okay, so I see now these what you're showing us here in these diagrams. There's nothing new in that. Right? Those are all particles I they're, they're know all particles I you know about. Um, there's two diagrams. We have a, a penguin diagram and what's called a box diagram on the other side, because it's a, a square shape. You have in, in so they, these are just standard model particles. Mm -hmm. And the hope is the bits you see in, in red we can replace with something new. In okay. case there's a there's a new particle in there that's that's maybe heavier than the ones we know about, mm -hmm. or behaves differently to the ones we know about, mm -hmm. and we can replace the, these red particles you see in the picture with something new, and that will give us a, a different you, outcome experimentally. You don't actually yeah. replace. If I, if I understand, okay. Now, what's interesting to note in these, if you look at these two pictures here, is that there are there are each of them has four vertices, which means they're they're on a similar order. Uh, size, probably. The, the, the magnitude is probably similar, it's roughly similar. Similar order of magnitude there. Um, now, what you do, I, I mentioned that the vertices that you see in there, there's a, they're, they have a value between 0 and 1, and you multiply those by each other. But what's important to note also is that you would never see the difference between these. You would never... Experimentally, it's exactly the same. Experimentally, well, you see two muons that come out, mu, mu plus and mu minus. So, when you calculate it, you add them together. These two diagrams, all the diagrams that you can do, you add them all up, right? So if there's something new out there, it will be another one. It will add, it will add in. And it will add in, and then your probability, you will measure how often you see a mu plus and a mu minus. And if you get that much more often or more often than you expect, according to the theory, which we can calculate pretty well, then you have a hint, hey, there's something new. Exactly. The first thing you do is you look how often you see these, mm -hmm. these processes. And you try and well, you hope it doesn't match what you expect. OK. Let, let, me, let me ask, uh, you know, it, it, let's pretend I'm tweeting. If I, if I could tweet, I would tweet this question. What if you measure too low of a fraction? What if you don't see the mu plus and mu minus as much as you expect? Can our theorists give us an answer for that? Let me, let me see. You, you want to process <laughs> together? Well, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I would be all of them. <laughs> so, by the way, we, sh we should say that they are measuring even more interesting things associated with it, these diagrams, all kind of asymmetries. Maybe later they want to mention this. They are the, the guys who do all this effort. So we actually already know that the rate, the, the, the how frequent is this uh, process occurring at the LHCb is more or less consistent with what we expect. Once every 10 million uh, times you have these beads decay to this uh, S and uh, mu and mu plus and mu minus. But uh, again, at the level of quantum mechanics, there's this beautiful phenomenon of interference. So uh, I'm. I assuming that the, the audience show, uh, saw in the past this uh, nice pattern where you see um, a two photon which uh, provide a pattern of interference, or you can just think about waves in the sea that oh. you have a rise and a low of mm -hmm. the of the of the intensity of the wave. So since we are dealing with quantum mechanics, we can have this phenomenon now of interference, and that means that if we actually add few particles, which are again heavy, so we cannot see them in uh, directly. But if these uh, particles are there, they could actually cause a negative interference with the model, the, the contribution that we know how to calculate. And by this, we are going to measure, if you wish, the, the lower part of the of the patterns of, of the waves. And that could actually induce rate, which is smaller than what we calculate in the standard model. 
Again, this will make us uh, happy because that means that there's something beyond what we actually know about this uh, penguin diagram. Okay. Do you want to comment? Um, no, I think I think uh, so. So just just to quickly summary, if you you know if you drop a couple things in the water, or if you have two boats that go by, you see that waves don't just add up and give you something twice as high, but they also go down. And sometimes the level is the same. They've interfered with each other perfectly. And you have nothing there in that one particular spot. You can see that when you drop a couple things in the water. You can do that at home. I think that's safe. You can do that experiment. Take a couple peas and drop them in the water, and you'll see that the waves interfere with each other. And so that can happen because we have waves in quantum mechanics. That's the beauty behind it. And so their amplitudes can counterfeit. So we just want to measure a difference with what these theorists predict, right? <laughs> exactly. That's that's the, that's the hope in the end. Is we see something different, uh -huh. whether it be bigger or smaller, or different in other ways. And this is something to give out a hint to that. But uh, we don't just look at how often this happens. We can look at other things, that, that other properties of the decay. So we can look at whether the the particles that come out go go in the length distribution we expect, so whether they go in the directions we expect, or whether okay. there's some preferential direction, say, in the decay. And that might tell us something about what's happening internally. Sure. Okay, um, yeah, I was just kind of mentioning numbers, or, or adding them up, but also the, the, the angular distributions. Much like with the Higgs boson, we're doing the same thing, looking at its its, its spin, see if that agrees with growth. Um, and you guys, but Nico, you guys have more data getting yeah. processed. Is that right? Yeah, so basically, up to now, what we showed was mainly based on one third of the full data set because these measurements are uh, extremely complex, so it takes time to understand the data, correct for any effect that the detector might uh, insert because you don't want to make any mistake to confuse something that you made a mistake to measure for something new. So it takes a lot of time to understand the data and to correct for any possible differences. And then uh, we only did this for one third of our data set. Now we have uh, uh, other two, the, the rest of two thirds of data set that are uh, currently we are uh, still analyzing. And this uh, will uh, hopefully come soon. So we will measure more uh, observable, most, more quantities on the same decays with uh, more precision. Mm -hmm. So will you, will you make a discovery or not? We want to know. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> um, everyone hopes so. But, uh, Stay tuned. Only the data tells us. Uh, that that's that's the fun part of this. Um, let me let me maybe head on over over to uh, Fermilab direction where 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 Freya is, is is bravely fighting jet lag and looking at the social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, uh, it's actually at this time of day, it's fine. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, actually, there's a very interesting question that I saw pass uh, by, also from YouTube. Uh, and uh, it's from uh, 890 JKA. I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, uh, how do you experimentalists actually know that your, uh, that your uh, measurement is calibrated? How do you know that you've actually measured the right thing? It's very good question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what we have, uh, you, you, you showed some uh, uh, penguins diagram where we hope to find something new. But we have a set of channels where we know what should come out. We call that control channel. So, channels which are very, very similar, decays that are similar to what we want to measure, but for which we know that the standard model, the current uh, theory that describes uh, fundamental interaction, dominates. So whatever new is there is rare with respect to the standard model. So we first try to calibrate with this decays and see if we see what we expect. And then after we are uh, confident that uh, our, measure, our uh, measurements are OK, we look for the new stuff. And we often do that blindly. So first, you have to make sure that uh, your detector or your uh, uh, measurements is calibrated. And then, only then, you can look for the uh, new stuff. OK. OK. 
Very good. That's that's done. That's a very common trick for all of us experimentalists. The first the first thing we did uh, on on all of our experiments, I think, when we started getting collisions, was to look at what we call the particle zoo. Can we reconstruct what we saw in the past? Does it have the same typical mass? Is the correct rates that we expect? So we calibrate with all that classical physics now, which you <laughs> discover the standard model before you exactly. Discover. Classical physics, which is 20 years ago, I'm talking about now, <laughs> and uh, and we we see these measurements, and then we can go on and, and start and start exploring. A very very good question. Uh, is, is there another question, or should we get to the to the uh, trivia answer? Any uh, I have another question for you, if you yeah, want. Let's just do one more question, then we'll then we'll get to the trivia. I make them wait for this. So, <laughs> so uh, it's a question I like very much, mainly because of it, it describes a certain detector which I have a weak spot for. So, uh, um, uh, Michael Jobin, again, on YouTube, actually asked, uh, you guys talk about uh, particle longe longevity, uh, but these particles, they cannot leave existence, right? So, so what happens, really? Okay. So, I guess he's looking, yeah, I, I guess he wants some explanation about uh, particle decays. Well, particle decays, because the particles, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question, that we don't see them, there's some particles that decay before we can measure them. Is that the question? Um, well, I gave you the question. I think the question was, uh, I think what he wants to understand is how we identify these particles which indeed disappear and then change yeah. into other particles. Yeah. So, shall, shall I? Go ahead. Yeah, go so, ahead. So for the, um, we, have, we have a set of particles which live long enough in our detector to measure them. So there's, um, the muon, for example, lives a very long time in, in our detectors and passes all the way through the detector, depositing charge in, in bits of sensitive electronics as it goes. Mm -hmm. um, there are other particles which also live a long time. The, the B meson we're talking about at the moment is something that's quite short-lived, and uh, it's short-lived due to the due to properties of the standard model. It has to decay weekly, mm -hmm. and so it, uh, it it lives a small distance. It tends to live maybe a, a centimeter between our detectors. Uh, on average, I think it's a bit less than a centimeter before it breaks apart and it decays into lighter particles. Lots of these particles it decays into live, um, live long enough that they can pass through our detector. They live for a tiny fraction of a second, but they, they're going at such great, great speeds they get through our detector before themselves decaying into lighter particles and eventually decaying into the particles we see around us. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, B, the B meson is, uh, is one case of something that lives a, a bit longer. The, we mentioned the, the top core curlier, that, on the mm -hmm. other hand, decays almost instantly. So we, that, that is gone before we can, we can really see it's existed and we can only reconstruct the things that come from it. Mm -hmm. The B, on the other hand, is we can look at the fact that there's something that's, that's lived a, long, oh, well, a short lifetime and then broken apart into some other particles. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it lives a, a short time, uh, a time that's measurable, we can actually see it in our detectors. Okay, so so there's I mean, there's there's several several parts. I mean, one let, let's go with the B. When you when you see a B, which which decays very quickly, but it lives long enough, you can see a, a vertex you, that's separate from the where there was so a collision. You have these 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 proton proton collisions, and that mm -hmm. produces a lot of a lot of charged particles, and they all they all fly out. Mm -hmm. The B, on the other hand, we're talking about a neutral B, isn't charged, and that that flies flies away from this primary interaction. Uh -huh. Before it breaks up, and then it, it itself decays into these particles we can measure. Uh -huh. So what you see experimentally is you see all these tracks pointing back to the, the primary interaction, the way the protons collide, and then you see uh, a few other tracks which seem to come from a point which is a, a little bit separated. So separated by about a centimeter, say, in, right. in, our, in our detector. So that's and a so very good looking thing. for a, a small separation. A small separation. That's a very, it's a very good uh, example because you see nothing between the two. The B doesn't leave anything in that detector, yet it's, it decays at a certain point. And then you see some tracks that came from it, point back to where, where it died, let's say, where it decayed. There's a separation. We know what its lifetime is from measuring this many times. Yep. So you have an idea that that's probably a B. But then also you take the, the energy and the, the momentum of all these other particles and their angles and you reconstruct what's called the mass yeah, exactly. of whatever that particle was. And then from that mass, if you plot it, if it was nothing, which can happen sometimes, it would just be spread. It's it nice and smooth. And, value. Yeah. and if it's something, you get you a, see a, a statistical signal. And that was how we search for new particles. That's how the Higgs boson was found. You reconstruct the mass 
of a particle that, that it could have decayed from, and you plot that, and then you find out that sometimes that really is from something. So exactly. those, those are the, probably the methods there. I think we, we need to move on and, and get to the trivia uh, answer. Um, the, the question, which was given at 5.04, was answered at 5.05. Uh, and, and Freya, <laughs> who answered that? <laughs> Right. So there's actually, as uh, the granularity of YouTube only is, uh, is in minutes, uh, there are three winners. Uh -huh. So three people actually <laughs> had the question already uh, answered very, very quickly. So it is the Lardmeister, who said it was darts, and also Bailey Weiss, and Anskrio Stoyer, 84. Okay. Now, they didn't answer the full question. The full, the full question was actually answered one a minute later by Mega Dan Lex, uh, who actually completely answered the question. So also who was there, uh, that it was a darts game, uh, that they wanted to get the, uh, um, the Feynman diagram or the, the penguin in a paper, that that was what the bet was about, yeah. and who was there. Mainly uh, Melissa Franklin was there and, uh, and Serge Gouda. Yeah, exactly. So it was so to be fair to John, who's a really good darts player, Melissa placed the bet and then left early and Serge finished the game and beat <laughs> John. That's his that's John's story. I don't know, Serge might have a different story. Melissa might have a different story too. Uh, but yeah, they were playing darts. And and the challenge was simply the loser had to somehow get the word penguin into into their, their paper. And and it was only because John noticed later on that his diagram could be conceived to be a penguin. Uh, <laughs> that that it was then uh, it was that was how he managed to get penguin into his into his paper. So yeah, so congratulations, good job at answering that. Um, is there anything that you guys want to add? When are we going to get result final results from you guys that will tell us if you if you found new physics or not? Do you, do you know? <laughs> so um, well, we're working at the moment. We're working hard at the moment. Well, maybe not Nico and I at the moment. We're here, but um, work is going, <laughs> and hopefully um, by by spring next year, we should have some some new updates. Spring next year, okay. O on the full data set, results Did will come come slowly between now and then. But uh, uh -huh. that'll be the big rush. There's a big conference in springtime, uh -huh. Morion's conference, and I think there we'll have we'll have, have a lot of the results. Of the show. Is it, which <laughs> answers a question I get today. I I gave people a tour. Of Atlas, I took people underground to see the detector, and on the way back, I was said, "So you guys are on vacation uh, these two years while the LHC is down?" And to which my response is, "No, <laughs> we're working hard. <laughs> we, we have to work hard. We have a lot of data to analyze, and uh, all of the experiments are working on analyzing your data as well as upgrading uh, for the for the next collisions at the higher energy. And every few minutes, someone is making a new weld." Down in the LHC, so there's a lot of work going on, and there's people like Freya flying to all corners of the world uh, to, to to talk to other physicists as well. Um, let me just move on. So I saw some things flash up here on on our screen. We're next, week's show. next week's show. Okay, so um, next week we're going to go to something completely different. Going on the penguin theme. I don't know. Monty Python always comes to my head when I think of penguins. And now we're going to go to something completely different. Next week we're going to um, talk to three three presenters, the, the top three presenters uh, who will be giving three minute speeches on a show called uh, Talent, a, a project called Talent. Their, their challenge will be to explain something in, in three minutes, uh, which will do a lot better than I do. Uh, so we're going to get the, the, these, these top three are going to come and they're going to be on our show. We're going to see which one's the best. We're going to see, oh, on our show we're going to see we who's the best? Wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, okay, so that's that's going to be our next show on the on the 13th of June. We always do these on Thursday at five o'clock uh, time in Geneva. I'll let you calculate wherever you are in the world what time it is there. Uh, and uh, I I think that's that's it. I I should mention I always mention upcoming events. We actually we just had a recent event that took place here at CERN, and there was it was we had a lot of people show up because it was the first maybe because it was the first sunny day. We had in the past 17 years, as far as uh, I could tell. Uh, so, so we had a lot of people on bicycles riding around the LHC, the inauguration of of, of the um, Passport Big Bang. And if you do make it over here, you should try this out. Where there's something explaining 
what's beneath your feet all around the place now. That was for the local people around here to see. A lot of people ask, what are you guys doing? So that was our answer. Uh, we also will have open days at the end of September, and we expect lots of people. So if you're planning your vacation, come on over here, September 20th and 29th. And if you happen to be in the Montreux area <laughs> on, on July 18th, I'll keep plugging it. CERN's going to be going to the Montreux Jazz Festival. And so we're going to have some different things about the physics of music and the music of physics. Anything else you guys want to plug? Uh, uh, I don't think so. No, anything going on LACB? Any big parties that we need to, to get over to? No? Yeah, one, one thing is that... Uh, There's the Atlas TRT barbecue. The TRT barbecue, okay. <laughs> and LACB? You, you mentioned that uh, uh, we will have new data as uh, spring next year, but one yeah. thing we, we should mention is that LACB is also planning an upgrade in the future. Well, uh, uh, precision that now is unconceivable will be available. We could measure very, very high precision there. Okay, and high precision helps us to find out where the standard model will break. So the big race is who is going to break the standard model. And uh, so thank, I want to thank you guys uh, for joining us, uh, both Nico uh, and, and Tom, and, um, and also our, our guest theorist, Gilad. Thanks a lot for being on the show. And I also special thanks uh, to Achintia behind the scenes somewhere back there, uh, who's, who's our director. Uh, also, there he is. We saw him. We saw him. <laughs> Many thanks to Kate over here who's producing the show and who, who puts her finger in every once in a while. And, uh, and thanks a lot, Freya, for joining us at the last minute and helping us out with the social media. really appreciate that. And we'll see you guys again next week. So we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.